right, everyone. I'm here today with Global Futurist. You know him. You love him. I know him and love him. He's my friend, Sohail Inyatella. And uh, we uh, got this opportunity to talk about decision making uh, through the lens of transformational futures. So, Sohail, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much, Frank. Great to actually spend some time with you, even oh, if so even if just just virtually. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think we've actually ever been in person together, but we've you know talked online for over a decade. So it's uh, it's sort of crazy to uh, never have seen each other physically face to face, but it's great to, to have this conversation with you today. And I wanted to take this opportunity for us to speak about something that I know is near and dear to your heart, near and dear to my heart, and this idea of transformational futures. As a matter of fact, it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe more than that, time slips away quickly, um, that I remember that you are somebody from uh, Meta Futures. Um, your organization was writing online under the Meta Futures banner about um, the power of transformational futures. And of course, I put hearts all over it and, and loved it. And I think you wrote me back and said, you know what, you were one of the people I was thinking of when I wrote um, this piece. And um, I could understand that because I know that I've written a, a good bit about this as well. I was having a conversation with some people this week. And, and I think um, there's sometimes a lot of confusion about you know, the role of foresight and uh, sort of the application of foresight. And of course, the history of foresight goes all the way back to you know, numbers and forecasting, but there's been a lot of evolution since that time. And, um, and so you and I talk a lot about transformational futures, you much more than I do. And so I would love to just start this conversation off with having you speak to this idea of the decision-making impact of transformational futures. How does transformational futures, and I guess we sort of need to define that, um, how does that really help us to make uh, real uh, hard decisions today, the decisions we need to make in our companies and our organizations and our governments, et cetera? Let me, I mean, I'll give you some examples of what I try to do. So I was working for a leading uh, trucking insurance company hmm. and they were the number one in this country. And as we went through the day, it went finally to, okay, well, what's our purpose here? We did emerging issues, risks, we did scenarios. It became very clear where our purpose is actually national safety. So I said, great. I said, so what are you selling? We're selling insurance, trucking insurance. Is there a risk? Yes, large reinsurance companies in Europe can take us over. So our core product could be finished very quickly. So given that our true purpose is safety, I said, well, how do we actually create safety for truck drivers? And we shifted then from selling insurance to actually moving towards bioinformatics. This was six, seven years ago. Mm. So now there's a shift from here's what we're doing to here's what we could be doing. So that's quite a big shift. Now that went really well until the head of insurance at the end of the day actually had a panic attack. Got very angry. Sort of said, well, so hell's a fun guy. This is a fun process. But do we really want it? But, and then of course, at that time, I didn't quite know what was going on. And I should have said, so tell me your story here. And he would, he would have, if I was authentic, he felt authentic that I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. So that's a transformational event. He said, okay, we want to go towards bioinformatics. How do we ensure everyone on the team stays on board and we do better? As it turns out, after he insulted me, this was just fun, but this is a clown day. And I just said, I just stayed quiet. I, I was clear, this is not my decision. And the CEO jumped in. He said, no, we're actually serious about this. Mm. And this goes to the board. And this is part of our new national campaign. And actually, it became that. And they became leaders in that. And it wasn't so much of a jump because there were already leaders in ICT. So bioinformatics, then genome, personalized, wearables, all that was still way out, but it was starting. So they understood each truck driver has a wearable. We monitor stress. We reduce traffic accidents to make the country safer. So that to me was powerful. A new vision, new technology, and jumping there. So this is kind of the transformational part. Now, most organizations, if they're not ready, the head of insurance, the dinosaur, the person holding on to the past, they have value, but they take over. And it goes from a no change to a marginal change scenario. Hmm. Now, our work in future is as the world changes, what's the adaptive? Where's the place we could go to given climate change, gender equity, decolonization, ICTs? 
But the question I think you and I always ask, well, what's the radical future? What's the one after that? So again, with, a, with the, one of the largest car companies in Asia Pacific, when we did this, I said, okay, what's your no change scenario? They said, we'll just sell bigger cars. Yeah, we'll just sell bigger cars for Asia. Asians are getting richer, bigger roads, bigger cars, done. Right. I said, well, what's a bit of marginal change? Okay, bigger cars, but more personalized cars. Okay, mm. That made sense. Yeah. I said, okay, we've done that, but really, is that only the place you want to play? I said, mm. what's an adaptive scenario? And I said, well, adaptive scenarios, we start to think about pods, artificial, you know, driverless pods, and start to think about not just our car, but the environment around the car. So electric, electric cars, pods, et cetera. Yeah. And I said, great. Now let's go to the transformational scenario. And this became the fun space. And so they said, actually, we need to be selling mobility. That's right. Should we become a subscription service? Why are we just selling cars? Shouldn't we be part of Asia's green climate change revolution, a greener Asia, a safer Asia? And then this got them very excited. So that's a dramatic shift. And so this last part of it, and of course that was too far for the CEO, but that's okay. I, I, you know, my intention is not, we put out the new image and eventually it becomes reality or it can become reality. It doesn't have to. That's right. So this last part was very exciting. And of course I knew it was too far ahead, but our role with futures is of course to go too far ahead to push them. And so then maybe they accept the adaptive change, but clearly I would have felt my work failed if the conclusion of our work was we're selling bigger, more gas gasoline cars. Yes. Now, they, someone could someone could have made the argument, well, strategically, given the numbers for the short term, and they would actually say long term, that's where we should be. And so, work future. So, you want to, you're buying the used futures, then you've been doing this. Other people are doing it. Why are you just doing what everyone else is doing, SUVs? Shouldn't you be thinking about what could Asia look like? What do Asians really want? And so, that starts a whole different discussion. Yeah, a totally different discussion. And you brought up so many good points there. Um, because one of the things that I was thinking about as you were speaking, and it's almost this H1, H2, H3 concept yeah. that's you know well-known in futures. Yeah. And so a lot of people come to the table and they're thinking, my decision matrix is within H1. But what yeah. you really yeah. suggested there is their decision matrix is an H2. It is, yeah. First of all, we you know they're, they're contemplating H1 we're taking them to H3 and then that sweet yeah. spot is sort of in that H2 space for them to make those decisions. So, you know, having said that, I think there's is something that you probably could jump off there too, but I would say, yes. And let me also add this before you answer that piece. A lot of people, you know, will come back and say, but, but is that really the decisions they need to make today? Because as you said, use futures, they dwell in these use futures. And so and they feel unless they see these numbers and they can really attach it to some kind of, uh, you know, numerical output or, you know, forecasting more of what they have today, then it's not really a decision. It's not really a useful decision. As a matter of fact, there's even a quote that I read sometime back that was written in, I can't remember where it came from exactly, but it said that um, foresight isn't really useful for, in the traditional sense, for decisions that matter. But it sounded like what you just said a minute ago, it's more useful for the real decisions that actually matter. So what's your comment so to this, that? Yeah. This is the tough one. So I want to honor Rob Burke. Rob Burke is a former CEO of a large yes. mining company in Australia. And he just passed away um, right. um, yesterday morning. Yeah. So we taught a class together for 20 years at Melbourne Business School. And it was 20 years, CEOs, head of strategy, and CFOs would take it in the Asia Pacific region in Australia. And there are two instances where Rob, I felt, was, I mean, he was powerful all the time, but I remember. One was we had a head of strategy for a large IT company. Mm. And it was a four-day workshop course retreat. And after the first hour, she said, can we just get to it? Just tell us the future already. Uh -huh. And uh, I was really puzzled because I was like, you couldn't know what to say. And Rob said, okay. And he said, yeah, I know the future. I can tell you. And that person said, great, tell me. Well, the problem of your company is this. And she goes, what is it? Because what's well, you? And that moment was, and the whole meeting just stopped. Did he just really say that? Yeah. You know, they're paying quite a bit. It's a four day. They have to pay 10K each. And then he said, futures is a deep learning journey. Mm. 
you have to figure out it's you start with forecasting if you need of course but you want to go from the known to the unknown That's you right. want to go from the possible to the impossible you want to go towards what's comfortable to the uncomfortable you want to go from strategy the chess set where you get your thrill from moving the piece to say what's underneath the chess set why are some kings some queens some pawns what's the matrix What's the rules we've created in the world? How do we recreate those rules? And this Everyone said, aha, we're on a learning journey. He said, please slow down. And he said, the hospital, he was working with the CEO there. Once he said the hospital was, okay, give me strategy for a better hospital. He said, first, let's ask you, what's your metaphor of being a hospital CEO? Yes. And this, he goes, what do you mean? Just tell me the strategy. Is it more nurses? Is it more AI? Is it, said, no, what's your metaphor? Yeah. The person said, aha, I'm a fast car where the tachometer is in the red. And this close to a heart attack, cancer event. I said, okay, you want better strategy. And as head of hospital, clearly you're the one who's the problem. He said, what's the better story that gets you to slow down? You may still need to speed up, but what's the story that gets you to slow down so you can make the difference? And so this started to move for what's the real decision making. And again, the set, the other point with Robert, yeah. I remember we were, we had a CFO and it was the same issue. This is not so useful. What do I do with this? And he kept on admiring the problem and arguing for the present. And then Rob finally said, look, if you're okay being the CFO, then fine. Stay embedded in what you know. You don't need the visioning. Stay with what you know. It's working for you. Right. He said, you did sign up for a four-day course on futures and transformation. Right. <laughs> so part of you wants to be here. Yeah. Then he asked him, so do you always want to be the CEO, CFO? Or actually, do you dream of being the CEO and using your role to create the preferred future? So the only thing the CEO does is create the preferred future. Yeah. There's managers for everything else. You're the visionary. You're leading people. So tell me, what do you want to be and do here? That's your decision now. That's the real decision. Yeah. Everything else is just safe zone stuff. And then the entire room just changes. Aha. Uh -huh. Here's why we're here. That's so powerful. And I love the way that you put that story in the context of that's the real decision. Because I think that there is the thinking about decision-making impact through transformational futures, you have to redefine what important decision-making is in many ways, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, this, what I get so much is, uh, I mean, the way to talk, I mean, I've used this example before. I had one uh, head of uh, education and he's really doing well. And I said, great, what's the issue? He goes, look, I get emerging issues. I get scenarios, all that I can do. What I can't do is my deep sense of discomfort when I enter a meeting and I don't know the rules anymore. Yeah. And I, then we describe, he said, I don't know what the issues will be anymore. Is it now climate change? Is it gender equity? I don't understand non-binary relationships. None of that makes sense. It's scaring me to death. Yeah. And this is very honest. And he felt safe enough to say as great. within his yep. gender, his ethnicity, his role, he yep. was nervous now. So I said, look, I'm not here to do social justice theory with you. Tell me if your life was a metaphor. What is it? He goes, aha. Uh -huh. He's a tennis player. He said, I'm playing tennis. I always went on hard court. I never know now which court I'm going to be playing. Wow. And so he said, you can give me information on AI, student perceptions, uh, new markets in education. I get all that. That's pretty easy. Yeah, I, that's We can all figure that out. But I can't figure out who am I in this changing world. I said, okay. So you're a winner in hard court, but you don't know what the next court will be. He goes, mm -hmm. yeah. So then I said, okay, the new story is the man, person who can play on many courts. That's awesome. And I said, so, okay, if that's the case, tell me your new skill set. He goes, aha, I, emotional intelligence, multicultural intelligence, wow. tech intelligence, wow. adaptability, agility. And I said, okay, now we know what you need to do. That's different from when you showed up. You wanted better forecasting skills yeah. to understand student numbers for 2040. Not that you, you can still do that. You know, yeah. No one's going against that. That's useful to have. You want some data. But now that's not the real issue. Then I said, okay. <laughs> now he was happy. 
And I said, now let's go back to the real, real issue. Why did you become a CEO? Because I got involved in all this for the fun of the game. Oh, that's it was crazy. it was never about the checklist of things I need to do yes. so I can make decisions so I feel better that I did something. Yeah. I love the rally. Wow. And I've lost the rally in my daily board meetings. It's all wow. about strategy, short term. Who am I firing? Who am I hiring? How that's are we right. optimizing? That's right. I said, if it's the rally, now tell me what you're doing. So the tennis ball is going back and forth, and I'm in this joy, flow, bliss. I said, who are you now? He said, aha, in 10 years, I'm the coach. This was always about fun wow. and always about flow. Wow. And then he understood, and we both felt it. If you're in fun and flow and joy, the rest is pretty easy. People pick up on it. You right. know because you're in a mindful state. What's the best decision? Yeah. Now, your mindful state has been disrupted mood because the world has changed and you've addressed that That's right. and so he's very honest authentic mindful and now what do we do with the new story and then you can ask yourself okay if i'm this what should be my new product what's my new strategy that all makes sense but That's there's right. that shift and in the un language the problem has been it's always we do to you i had a meeting with the five largest oxfam caritas world vision etc yeah, and the and the issue became in all their strategies, whether to move the head office to Africa, or to have new ways to fund. It all became we do to you. It's still us as large donors doing things to those who are helpless. Yeah, that's right. And then someone you know said, okay, well, what's what's the better story? He said, well, we do together. Mm. And this became quite the insight. I know it seems very simple, but if you know, if you have an organization with tons of money, global reach, but your model is still there's helpless people there, I'm the powerful one. I'm doing to them. That's right. And it became if we're doing this together, then the poor people are not our people we're developing. They're our stakeholders. Yeah. They're our partners. Then how do we work with them? So this became the thing from no strategy. Let's just see what happens today. To strategy, we're doing this to you. Let's optimize based on futures tools to transformation. We're on this boat together. Wow. There's no place in the universe where I'm outside of it. We're inside. Everyone's inside. Now what's the best way forward? So the person and the future are not separated. We're integrated. Yes. That's so powerful. What a powerful story. I know how impactful that would be to people to hear it. And again, this brings me back to the power of transformational foresight or transformational futures, because as you said, if forecasting is necessary or there's a space for that, or we have to circle back to that because we have to forecast our way through yeah. a certain you know, period, then that's fine, but it doesn't shift our decision matrix, right? And so there's this whole swap of decisions that we didn't even know existed or needed to exist, that once that's opened up to us, now, when we say, does foresight help me with decision-making? Well, yeah, it actually a, a, a illuminated a swath of decisions you didn't even know were there to make that are necessary or important for you to make that are critical. As a matter of fact, it's reminding me of uh, a similar story. A couple of years ago, we were working with the Metro in Santiago in Chile, and the um, CEO um, came from a, a background. He was airline before, I think. He might have been the CEO of one of the South American Airlines. Um, but he said, I didn't take this job because I want to run a better metro. I took this job because I believe in the well-being of society and about a happiness index, yeah. and which was, I think his team, it might have been one of the first times they ever heard it, they were sort of shocked by it. Um, but he revealed all this in front of everybody on this meeting that we have with them. And so he said, well, he didn't say, but through the process of using foresight, their decision matrix shifted from how do we run a better um, metro in Chile and in Santiago in particular, to how do we frame transportation as a social well-being yeah, movement brilliant. throughout 
And, and so that's what the, and now actually the new CEO who was in the room at the time, he's retired, that other CEO retired. The new CEO this just past week has gone on a tour of South America telling the other metros in Peru and different places, this is what we've learned and you've got to shift the way that you see what a metro even is for. What is the purpose of a metro? It's not to transport people to jobs in the morning. It's to make sure that everybody has well-being, equity, um, yeah. that we don't have, you know, swaths of poverty across. And so it reminds me again of that idea of opening up decisions that you didn't even know were there. So this statement, does foresight really help me with the decisions I need to make? But are you even making the right decisions, right? Yeah, so I like your framework. So rule number one is decisions I need to make about things we know about. There's agreement, there's data, there's trend analysis. That's rule number one. Mm. Rule number two is decisions I need to make about things I don't know about. So we use emerging issues analysis right. scenarios. Yes. Rule number three is really for me what causal analysis is about. Here's decisions, what you just said, decisions I don't even know I need to make. I don't know who I, who's the decision maker. I don't know the future. I'm in really unknown worlds. In that sense, the comfort comes from knowing my story and being part of the shift. Powerful. So that third space is where not everyone has to work in that area, but you and I enjoy working there. Yep. We did, me and Ivana we did with Provident Government New Zealand. They said, okay, wow. if well being is the future, what would infrastructure look like? Yeah. And so then it was saying, well, but infrastructure is not just about buildings, it's cultural resources, mm -hmm. it's their visions for the future, yeah. it's social, social cohesion. So the, our report was New Zealand Autoria 2070, yeah. well being and infrastructure. Powerful. And so that. That again, it shifts the decision make decision making matrix. Yeah. So that goes back to Ram's point, and he was see futures as a learning journey. Mm. So I know when we worked with Wishan Lam Singapore government, it was six, seven years ago. Yes. It was about future of airports. Yes. And I re remember that well because it was okay, retail, selling perfume, cosmetics. And then the shift became 3D printed avia 3D printed avionics. And the final shift was actually make the airport a learning center. Mm, so powerful. <laughs> and the minister, minister gave 50 million, let's experiment. So now the airport is not just those things, it's something else. And we're clear, we don't know what that is. Yeah. Is it now three years of this where we experiment on COVID in terms of public policy and airport safety? Wow. Is it where we do 3D printed avionics? Is it? And now you've reframed it. Yeah. And they've actually done it well. The last part we didn't do was everyone in the room, who are we? And that story part is mm. getting clear. As I enter the room, what's my narrative? What's her collective narrative? Mm. And if I do that first, I do well. When I don't do that first, it was one time I really messed up. This is 20 years ago. It was a large government firm, and their metaphor was... Uh, Cinderella waiting for Prince Charming. Hmm. So I said, who's Prince Charming? Prince Charming is government funding. We spend most of your applying for government funding to get it. So we're always waiting for the kiss. Yeah. And then the effort became, well, how do we get out of only government funding? How do we get citizens involved, private sector involved, new forces of funding? So that all made sense. Yeah. In this language, changing the areas where we make decisions. The part I messed up on, there was an inner dynamic, dynamic going on. There was a CEO and two vice presidents. One vice president loved futures. The CEO was collecting data. The other vice president was really upset because she could see her role was going to be up usurped. Right. And then by the end of the day, she became so nasty and angry. And finally, I said, who are you? you no, know, I said, what's going on? And she said, can't you tell I'm the wicked stepsister? Now, to her credit, she authentically revealed her role. To my discredit, I didn't say, okay, that's who you are now. Where do you want to go, given yeah. we're going to go from Cinderella, right. Sleeping Beauty, et cetera, to something else? Wow. So my inability to work with her to create a transformational journey meant we went back to strategy simply, how do we get more funding? Ah. Uh. And really, KPMG, PwC, there's so many good companies who can do that. They didn't need me there to help them do that. Right. That's right. And so this is where I've got clear when it gets uncomfortable. That means there's some energy. 
mm. some decisions to be made. Yes. And the decision yes. is really about forecasting trends. The decision is about wow. the inner story of the organization, wow. power relations. And if I can do that well, then I'm doing futures and I'm mindful about my role in their journey. Yeah. That's but, so you know, like everyone else, I can get anxious and, in this case, she made me anxious. She got me scared. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> She's attacking me. What do I do? I like defend instead of, wait a second. This person could be our biggest asset if I hang out with her. That's we it. all hang out and work with her. That's and it. And I was unable to. So now I do my best to figure out, you know, the anger can be the gold. That's super powerful. I, I, I We've always said that the, the biggest critic in the room, if... Yeah. If yeah. we're wise enough and we're calm enough yeah. and we're and we're quiet enough or we interject correctly, because a lot of it's about facilitating, right? It's really not about yeah. skills and it's about facilitation. It's about relationships, it's about people and the aha moments, as you often say. And uh, they they be, they can become our biggest, you know, converts, the biggest um, you know, people that will advocate, the biggest advocates of the work. And I've seen that so many times. You were reminding me too, when you were speaking about New Zealand, of course, you've done extensive work in that area of the world. Well, really all over the world, but definitely in New Zealand, Australia. Um, and uh, we had the privilege for five years of working with the ports of Auckland. Oh, and, uh, and one of the first meetings we ever had with them, of course, I'm breaking out CLA. Thank you, Sohail. And um, they you know, started off with this story and they actually have, I, I don't know if I've ever told you this or not. We, I, I, I'm so glad that we're talking just to tell you this story, if nothing else, that, um, you know, in Auckland, if you go down to the ports down at the bottom of the city, there's a big red fence that's around okay. the port. Okay. And so their metaphor was we're the red fence. Uh, um, because everybody wants that land. It's, you know, sacred land. Okay. Interesting. Um, of course, TGI Fridays wants to land, you know, retail. Yeah, yeah. Want to land. And uh, that's where the ports are. And it really can be quite an eyesore there in, in, in Auckland. And um, and so they said the community doesn't know it, but that red fence represents who we are to them. We've put up a red fence. Um, yeah. And so when they went through CLA from going yeah. down and then going back up again, they went from this idea of we are the port, which they define that to mean that we bring in slag and cars and all of this unsightly stuff, the red fence metaphor. Um, they went back up and they said, we're a portal. We moved from a port. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, it's, it's oh, that's br really brilliant. Oh, it was amazing. That's and so it opens up. Okay. And so the CEO and all the big you know players were in the room and they said, this is who we are now. We don't just bring in slag and cars and you know the goods. We have to bring in um, education. And um, we're literally going to open up our data to the community so that off the back of the, our data, they could build entrepreneurial businesses. Um, they built a new part of the of the ports where the community could come in and learn. Um, different technologies and bring technologies in. And so they, they, by that, they were tearing down the red fence. And, and, uh, and I say that story as a response to what you said, but also as another question, because what you're saying is so critical and important in terms of doing that initial work. But through this conversation so far, you've told us all these great stories about these people saying, I'm the this and I'm the that, or I see myself as this. And, and I know a lot of the people listening will know that have probably used CLA before or might know how to use CLA, but how do you get somebody like that, like the CEO or the CFO or these managers or leaders to say who they are? Are they actually going through the tool or do you use other methods to say, who are you? And, and, and then you said, you know, they come up with, I'm the tennis player, I'm the, I'm the wicked stepsister. How did they arrive at those things? So there's... So when there's a safe space, I do CLA of the self. So phase one is really the usual, you know, shared history, futures triangle, merging issues. The thing we do well, disruptions, get to scenarios. And then and then when I find so many organizations call me that we've done the scenarios, now what? So we have four futures of the changing world. Now what do we do? Yeah, yeah. And that becomes a critical point. 
So I know when I was working for law enforcement for the last 12, 14 years, it's great. we understand policing is a thin blue line. Yeah. Police on one side, system on the other. And that makes sense in usual dangerous conditions. Yes. But if your role is harmonizing law enforcement all over the world, mm. and you see all stakeholders as threatening, then how do you create an interpol of law enforcement working together? Mm. And, so, and how do you connect with citizens who actually want to help you? So the thin blue line works, and then it really doesn't work. So then it's saying, we need a new story. That's right. And then with commissioners, you have to ask them, okay, if the new thin blue line, I know in one meeting of 100 law enforcement leaders, they said, okay, we're the conductor of the orchestra. In meaning thin blue line is, there's a line, you can't cross it, and we have very clear uniform, ununiform. The conductor of the orchestra, actually, this is about the criminal justice system, actually, citizens are part of it, actually, and of course, we have a special role. But how do we conduct that? So there's a collective new story. Yeah. The individual part is once everyone feels safe, then I take them through the process. Here's the issue. What am I facing? What does this remind me of? What's my current metaphor? And what's a better story? And that better story emerges through that seal of itself. With one leader, I know we did the futures party. And she says, okay, can I pre get 10 minutes of your personal time? I said, mm. sure. She said, well, what's the issue? The issue is, okay, I've had cancer. I just survived it. I'm still running the company. And I said, great. What's the issue? The issue is I want to kill my husband. And, you know, I thought, is this, is this, is this a metaphor or what's yeah. going on? Wait, what? Goes, Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, tell me more. He goes, look, I'm a cancer survivor. I now want to travel. We should, you know, we have a, I think, I can't remember, it was a small business, a mid-sized business. Yeah. Sell the business, let's me and you go on a trip around the world. Oh, wow. And the husband's response was, no, I just want to drink beer and watch TV. Well, oh. So she felt, well, you weren't there for me in the journey. And now when it really matters, you're not there. Uh. And I said, okay, so scenario one is you kill him, you go to jail, result. <laughs> That's What's scenario two? Horizon one. <laughs> yeah. Scenario yeah. two is, I, yeah, scenario two metaphors that I get in my Ferrari and leave. I said, okay. Great. So that sounds good. What's preventing you from that? She goes, well, there's a, one of my selves. And this is the journey within our futures. We have many selves, many stories within us. And when they're not always in alignment in terms of our preferred future. Mm. So I said, what's the second story? The second story is I'm five. My mom tells me, this would have been 1940s, good girls don't leave their husbands. Mm -hmm. So she said, if I leave him, I know I'll get ill again because I'll have gone against my good girl self and my mom will be angry even though her mom's passed away so now we're stuck wow she has two futures and this is post you know her company so is there a third space we can go to and she figured out she goes yeah horse-drawn carriage the doors open i'm slowly gonna leave their husband join me we partner we go together and it's going to be at a pace you can manage Getting off the couch, drinking beer, watching TV can't be done quickly. Mm. So now she's coming from compassion, understands his fear, anxiety, mm. understands her need to get out of the situation. Right. And so this became a third space. For that to happen as a facilitator, either they do it privately or the room has to feel safe. Yeah. And yes. and and not everyone does. But when there is safety, again, with uh Cheryl Doig would think beyond. When we did the final silly, one Maori leader, she stood up and used Maori language. Wow. But in English, the part was, children are very important to us. We don't have kids. So I feel I don't have my community. Mm -hmm. And as she said this, people in the part of them said, where are your future community? So her new story became going from not having biological kids to everyone's my new ohana, my new community. Wow. And so, you know, she publicly shared and everyone in the room said, okay, we're now part of your future generations, your oh. future's community. Wow. That's powerful. Now, then once you've done that, then, you know, of course, those of us who are rational, strategic, database, okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means, okay, now here's your friends. What project do we do yes. that we're doing things together? Yes. So it's community creating.
Yes. So I always end up on that. You've got the new story. What does that new story mean in the known world? That's where the decision-making known That's world right. comes in. That's powerful. But now I'm coming from the space of the future I wish to see, not the past I'm admiring. Mm. And so that's really our role in futures. Changing world, new vision, new image, what story that gets us there, and real action learning steps that move us forward. That's our that's what I feel is our purpose, our vision, our job. I couldn't agree with you more because to me, that's where the most powerful decisions come in of all. I think you mentioned earlier that those decisions that I think a lot of people are saying, does foresight really help me make these traditional decisions that matter? Um, uh, the answer seems to be a resounding yes, but if you think the only decisions that matter are to stay on the status quo or on the same, like you said, the used features of those past visions, um, then you're missing, you know, this whole wonderful space. And, 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 and as you said, you know, those are the decisions that really matter. I wanted to end our conversation because I don't want to keep you forever, but I, before you go, I wanted to, um, I wanted to just address this idea of, uh, you know, this really changing world, because a lot of what we talked about now is a, is a vastly changing world. As a matter of fact, all the stories that you and I have been telling in the last few minutes are all about people coming to the realization, I can't just keep making the same decisions over and over. I've got to make different decisions because the world seems to be, you know, very different. And of course, we're dealing with climate collapse and, you know, social unrest and change across the board. And um, I, I go back and over and over again, I watched this amazing talk that you gave um, at the uh, Asia Pacific Conference a few years ago on Thanos, you know, and, and him gathering the the stones, Thank you. new stones. I love, love, love. That's one of my faves. And um, and so I, I'm, I'm saying that because I'm thinking about a lot of people today, futures and, you know, not in the futures community, who would say, you know, swinging the pendulum on the other side, and I'm not saying that's wrong, um, the only decisions that really matter right now is that we make new decisions that we change because you know who cares about these decisions you're making we're dealing with a collapsing climate we're dealing with you know these devastating issues as you spoke in that conversation you know at Asia Pacific if anybody wants to see that it's on YouTube we'll probably put a link here um when i when i publish this piece um you know, the, the, these are the, the, you know, we need to gather these stones of a very changing world. And so could you just speak briefly before we end our conversation today about those kinds of decisions and, and what it means to make decisions that really matter in a world that we're facing? I mean, conceptually, again, it's clarifying the, my preferred future. What is that? At the system level, say my preferred future is a global governance system that works that addresses crime across nations, that addresses pollution across nations. So level one is better agreements among nations. Now we're clear that's operating in a UN system from the 1940s, where only nation states are eligible to make decisions. Yeah. The reality is corporations make decisions, citizens make decisions, NGOs make decisions, large donor groups make decisions. So the decision-making who makes decisions is not covered by the agreements we have from the 1940s. Mm. So it's a global new contract that's being made under traditional strategy. How do I enhance the decision-making of nation states? Questioning the future means, why is it only nation states have decision-making? Mm, right. And now we create the new framework. What does the new UN system look like? Now that's a conceptually big picture stuff. Personally, we're all addressed as editor of journal Future Studies, Anissa, Jose, myself, consultant Gander, Zivana, Dater, and many others. We got a paper that feels like it's half human, half AI. And suddenly it was sent to us, and I went through it, and then we kind of first did, you know, blind refereeing, and then I said, actually, I sent a message to the editor. Something's different here. Oh, boy. And suddenly it was like, okay, so what do we do here? That's a bad paper. Because the AI and the human part don't mesh oh gosh so there's a normal criteria it's rejected but now suddenly what do we do with ai papers well referencing of course is okay what yeah. about content yes and now suddenly and so that becomes the policy decision that we have to make and figure out now, i sent it to data and data came back and said as one robot to another robot this is not fun why are you making policy yeah 
<laughs> and what he hinted at is what happens when AI submits an AI paper. Yeah, exactly. And both of us know that's not so way off. So what's our role with AI submitting AI through its our portal to us? Yeah. And I actually don't have an answer to that. <laughs> that's I said, okay. That's, I said, I don't know. I'm sort of glad you don't. <laughs> Can we open it up to colleagues yeah. and ask ourselves, do we ask an AI bot? Would yeah. you like to submit papers? And this is now putting us in an unknown space. Yeah. And so I, so now I don't know our new story here. Mm. I, so now suddenly we're actually not the journal of futures, we're the human journal of futures. Uh, uh, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I so said we're all <laughs> entered a new space. Yeah. We're exploring. We don't quite know the new rules, but I want to get clear on you know, And I don't know the new vision. Maybe we stay as human. Mm. Or maybe we're a human AI fusion, or maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is, yeah. uh, in terms of our own work, you know, we're forced into new spaces. That's right. That's right. And so I really don't have an answer. I will ask colleagues and maybe open up to the futures community. What should be our role in futures journal when AI presents not just half half, but AI actually writes the paper? Yeah. And so then I want to practice what we're saying on ourselves. What's That's our right. decision-making matrix? That's right. Is it just no? We're humans. We decide what goes in. Only human human articles, or is half half allowed, or is full allowed? Yes. Yeah, it's a powerful concept that we have to, you know, the futures of futures, right? How do we yeah. actually think about transformational futures and make those decisions for ourselves? Because yeah. it certainly yeah. has to work here if it's going to work anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I will, you know, we'll do a little future CLA. Who are we as a journal? Yeah. Because we thought we were this, but none of us questioned our humanness. It was obvious. Yeah. 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 And now suddenly that's being questioned with this paper. That's wild. Well, it's a good thing I haven't submitted my. It's a good thing I haven't submitted my piece yet because I sent the whole, whole thing through Chat GPT. He said, "No, I'm just kidding." There you go. That was, <laughs> that was me. Exactly. Was me. Why'd you call that me was out? You. <laughs> so, hell, brother, it's so great to talk to you, yes. my friend and mentor. I uh, we love you here at the Future School. Your oh, fans so sit out there in the office. I'm the only one on camera, but your fans are all <laughs> sitting out there in the office. And so um, it's been great to talk to you. And thank you so it's much for, for your time today. Uh, I know everybody's going to love this conversation because um, it, it just really highlights how powerful the work that we do is in illuminating these decisions that um, as that last story that you just told about the journal are things that we've never thought of before, but that we're being faced with. And those are the decisions that are going to make the difference going forward in the years and, and decades ahead. Warm hugs, big aloha. Thanks so much, Frank. Appreciate Thank it. You.